So without with further ado, I'd like to introduce, introduce Mary Steinbach from the Nurse Leadership Board. She's at the Huntsman Cancer Institute in Salt Lake City, where she says it's raining where she is. So maybe <laughs> that will turn into snow sometime and you'll get to go skiing. Yes, that's always the goal around here. Thanks, Mary. Thank you, Kelly. It's Yeah, it's a real honor for me to be a part of this workshop today with all of you. Um, I have the privilege to speak to you about how to manage symptoms related to multiple myeloma, side effects of the multiple medications we use. We've just had two wonderful talks from Dr. Cohen and Dr. Cole that touched on a lot of these medications and symptoms that patients have. So we'll just jump right in. Next slide. So you, most of us know multiple myeloma itself comes with a constellation of symptoms, as do the medications that we use to treat the disease. And sometimes it's difficult to tease it out, what, what's causing patients what. So often at diagnosis, patients experience fatigue, they may have an anemia, pain related to fractures or bone lesions. And then once we start treatment, patients can still experience pain, fatigue can be increased, um, peripheral neuropathy is a common side effect of some of the medications that we use. Dr. Cohen spoke to shingles and often patients who have multiple myeloma long before we recognize the disease do have frequent infections. And then again, the drugs we use can cause those infections. So it's really important to understand how you feel at diagnosis and then throughout your treatment course, and then always be speaking with your providers about the side effects of the medications we use. Next slide. So over the next few slides, we'll just touch on most of the FDA approved medications that we use for treating patients with myeloma. Um, a lot of them have a similar side effect profile. So I would say this myelosuppression category where patients can experience low white blood cell count, low platelet count, low red blood cell count. So anemia, neutropenia, thrombocytopenia. That's really a side effect across the board with all the multiple myeloma drugs. Um, the potential for peripheral neuropathy exists with the proteasome inhibitors along with some of the IMIDs, um, particularly thalidomide. That's not a drug we really speak to much at all anymore, but it is still used in Europe um, and sometimes in salvage treatments. And then um, there are some cardiotoxicities or heart side effects that are associated with some of the drugs we use. And the GI side effects can include diarrhea, constipation, nausea, and vomiting. And sometimes a lot of these medications, for instance, Revlimid is pretty well known to cause diarrhea for some people and constipation for others. So it's about figuring out what's, what's happening to you as the patient and, and then how we can help you with those side effects. Next slide. So this speaks to the monoclonal antibodies and then our antibody drug conjugates, the HDAC inhibitors, which includes this drug known as panabinostat, and then Expovio. And again, the side effects on most of these medications are pretty similar. Next slide. And then kind of our last bulk of myeloma drugs, some of these being the newer ones. Um, you see CAR-T here on the far side and we have cytokine release syndrome which Dr. Cole just spoke about as one of the major side effects. But again, I think we're gonna end up seeing as we use these medications, these newer meds more and more, that they probably have some other side effects associated with them too. The alkylating agents, so kind of our conventional chemotherapy that we use is pretty well known for um, sometimes, well, for infections that come along with low blood cell counts. Um, there are again, heart side effects and then these GI disturbances. Next slide. So steroids, Dr. Cohen mentioned that sometimes this is the least tolerable medication that we use. And it is really important. It, the dexamethasone is the most common steroid that we use for multiple myeloma. It is very important upfront. It does kill myeloma cells and it helps a lot of the drugs we use work better. Um, but over time and throughout the course of treatment, steroid doses can be reduced. And so I think a lot of times patients and even providers get stuck in this cycle of using higher doses of steroids and maybe not fully understanding what a patient's side effects are from them. So it's important to speak up to your providers about what you're experiencing as a side effect of the steroids. Um, you see listed around this person that irritability is a common one, sometimes blurred vision, bloating, 
uh, difficulty sleeping, weight gain, hair loss. So these are things that affect people on a daily basis. Um, and certainly around the dosing of the dexamethasone, whether it's twice a week or once a week. Um, so please speak up if you're experiencing any of these. There are some things we can do to help manage it. So depending on how you take your dexamethasone and when you take it may help to manage some of the side effects. Taking steroids with food is helpful. Um, and then again, sometimes patients need supportive, other supportive meds to help with the side effects that can come from the dexamethasone. I think more recently, we're doing a better job in the relapse refractory setting of perhaps starting with lower steroid doses and then getting patients off of steroids as soon as possible. And certainly some of the newer class of medications that Dr. Cole spoke to, we can even use them without any steroids. And that's a good thing for patients. Next slide. Fatigue, depression, and anxiety are very common symptoms for all patients with cancer, particularly with, for multiple myeloma patients. It's important to recognize, and this is, was shocking to me even to read, 70% of patients experience fatigue, but only 20% tell their providers. And so again, this plays into, you know, perhaps it, as you're newly diagnosed, you have a lot of fatigue associated with the amount of multiple myeloma, and perhaps that gets better through induction treatment as some of your disease-related symptoms improve, but it, it can come back certainly through the transplant period, certainly while on maintenance therapy and long-term maintenance. As Dr. Cohen mentioned, some side effects can pop up even when you've been on a medication for a very long time. I think the recent COVID pandemic has perhaps helped us all realize how important topics such as fatigue, depression, and anxiety are. Um, they certainly affect patients' quality of life, and there are a lot of things to do to manage them, and I think most importantly, a lot of the management can be non-medication based, so we know that exercise can make a good difference, proper sleep and being well-rested can make a, a good difference, having social support is super helpful, and that's why things like these community workshops are so important, um, meditation and prayer are helpful for some. And then there are medications that in certain circumstances should be used and certainly are very helpful. Next slide. Infection prevention and treatment. So infection is a risk of having multiple myeloma. And then again, with treatment, you may be at a higher risk for some infections. So common sense things to keep yourself Healthy and infection free is good hand washing. Nowadays, certainly wearing a mask is a very important component to this. Um, avoiding crowds at certain points during your treatment, perhaps if you're neutropenic or going through stem cell transplant. Being up to date on immunizations is a big recommendation of ours. Taking antibiotics or antiviral medications, depending on what treatments you're on is also certainly important. And then again, understanding what symptoms from infection might be, you know, upper respiratory symptoms such as congestion, cough, having a fever, being dizzy or feeling short of breath. Those are certainly all things you should be speaking to healthcare, your healthcare team about. Next slide. DVTs, so a deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. These describe a blood clot. And so um, very often for patients with any type of cancer, but particularly multiple myeloma, you're at risk for developing blood clots. Some of the medications we use for the treatment of myeloma can increase this risk. And so this is a symptom to be aware of. Um, often the symptoms of a DVT are um, warmth or redness in an extremity. They often happen in the lower extremities. So in your legs, having a swollen leg that is red and warm is something you need to report to your healthcare team. Symptoms of a pulmonary embolus, so that's a blood clot in your lung that is gonna be shortness of breath, perhaps chest pain, feeling your heart, uh, heart rate go up as you stand up and walk. These are things to be aware of. Um, we will often put patients on medications to help prevent things like DVTs and PEs, depending on certain risk factors with the rest of the medications that you're on. Next slide. GI symptoms, as I discussed, a lot of times the meds we use can either cause diarrhea or constipation, and it really is patient dependent. So whenever I meet a new patient and we're starting a treatment, I like to establish kind of what their regular bowel regimen is. Are you someone who 
it's typical to go to the bathroom every day or is it every couple of days? Have, do you have nausea in your life otherwise? And then just understanding what the potential are from the meds we're starting. There are lots of medications that are out there to use for diarrhea or even constipation. And then again, there's a lot of medications we use that cause some of these things. Um, nausea is something that happens pretty frequently through the autologous stem cell transplant phase for patients. And there's certainly very good medications we can use to help with that. Um, eating a well-balanced diet can be really, is really helpful for your GI system. Um, and you'll just see here like a long list of medications for some of these side effects. It's important to, to you know, maintain a healthy weight and be able to exercise and have stamina through all of your treatments. And so um, controlling GI symptoms is a good part of this. Next slide. So our kidney function, we talked a little bit earlier today about um, how changes in kidney function is part of, can be part of the diagnostic criteria for multiple myeloma. All myeloma patients are at risk for kidney or re renal dysfunction. And this is based on how the disease works and what those light chains can do and do and get stuck in the kidneys. So um, Dr. Cohen had mentioned that having a high kappa or not necessarily kappa, but having a high light chain number is a risk factor for damage to the kidneys. Certain other illnesses that are part of life, comorbidities such as diabetes or hypertension can cause changes to kidney function. So I think understanding the status of your kidneys and how you can help pre prevent any further damage is important for patients. On a very simple level, hydration is a good part of this. And I'm always talking to patients about being able to drink about two liters a day. And that's just like a, a goal for having a good hydration status. And then understanding other medications that you take and how they may pose potential risk to your kidneys, depending on what you're going through. Oftentimes at diagnosis, patients have poor kidney function. And then once we start treatment, this can be improved upon and you can really regain some of that kidney function back. And then it's just important through the whole course of your multiple myeloma to try to protect your kidney function as, as much as possible. Next slide. So lytic lesions and bone damage is a big part of multiple myeloma, and this can be with symptoms for patients or without symptoms. 85% um, of patients with multiple myeloma do have bone disease, and sometimes this ends up being a chronic pain situation for a lot of myeloma patients. Again, I think after we start treatment at the initial, after initial diagnosis, pain can be improved upon. We certainly have medications such as the bisphosphonates, and now exgiva and denosumab that we can use to help strengthen patients' bones. Um, good nutrition, weight-bearing activity, taking calcium and vitamin D are all things that are helpful for patients. Think recognizing what your bone status is in terms of um, burden of lytic lesions. And then if you have pain associated with those, um, oftentimes we incorporate pain management teams and taking care of our patients or physical therapy or physical medicine rehab team to help kind of maximize strength in other areas to help support your skeleton is very important. Next slide. Peripheral neuropathy, this is an ongoing long-term symptom for a lot of multiple myeloma patients. I think at the, certainly some patients at diagnosis already have peripheral neuropathy. It's it is occasionally described as part of the disease process itself and also can be associated with a component of a plasma cell dyscrasia that's called amyloidosis. Um, and patients can have peripheral neuropathy from other causes at diagnosis. But then we know, and it's described quite well, that Velcade and the proteasome inhibitors are likely to cause peripheral neuropathy. So this is a symptom you're always going to get asked about when you're seeing your myeloma providers. And it's important to describe to them exactly what you're feeling. Um, everybody sort of perceives peripheral neuropathy in a different way. And there certainly are objective ways that we can measure sense loss in your nerve endings. But I think a lot of patients um, end up having descriptions that can vary for people. So peripheral neuropathy, when it's induced by medication management or 
myeloma drugs such as Velcade, we know that um, reducing Velcade or to once a week can make a difference. Holding doses can make a difference. And a lot of, hopefully with time, this peripheral neuropathy can resolve for patients. But I think this is an important symptom because it can evolve over the course of a myeloma patient's treatment and lifetime. And it's important to consider when choosing medications, especially in the relaxed refractory setting when you may have a couple of drug options if you're someone who has had peripheral neuropathy previously, then maybe that's going to guide decision making to a different medication. There are supplements and some topical ointments. Um, there's even some light therapy that's described these days that can help patients with peripheral neuropathy. But again, when it's caused by one of the multiple myeloma drugs, the best things to do are either make a dose reduction or hold the medication. Next slide. Pain prevention and management. So this again does play out over the entire course of a multiple myeloma patient's life and treatment and adequate pain control really helps people to function, have less depression and anxiety and play a, continue to play a role in their lives and management. So I think pain prevention and management is super important and peripheral neuropathy can fall under this. So we do have pain medicine that can help patients um, a lot of people can be hesitant about using opioids or narcotics regularly for their bone pain. And I frequently am speaking to patients about um, initially getting pain under control and that it may not be a lifelong thing that they're taking an opioid. We can use radiation therapy to bone lesions to help with palliative effects of that pain and, and improve upon pain. Again, staying functional, exercising can all help with pain too, but it's important to not live with pain silently. Next slide. And that is it. Thank See, you for your time. Wow, Mary, that was really good. <laughs> Thank you. See, I told everyone it's here that this was going to be a big day and a lot of information is covered. We, we had, the, the nurse leadership board does a great job on helping you through what you're going through on the side effects. So uh, as I really want you to re re review this, I want you to get the answers that you're looking for by looking at the questions in the comments. And then I'd like you to uh, uh, just review it at your convenience. Now we're going to go to some Q&A here. And let's see. Uh, oh, here's a tough one. When is the best time to stop maintenance chemotherapy, is it over two years, five years, 10 years or longer? Do you have algorithms to make this decision? Boy, that's a pretty big question. I think you're muted, uh, Craig and Ann. There we go, Craig, go ahead. Yeah, I think that, um, that we still, you know, are still grappling with, with that, um, that, we, you know, still looking to see um, when's the best time. Um, and and, and it, it, the story is probably going to be made with um, um, with MRD um, and some of the trials that Dr. Cohen had mentioned earlier. Um, you know, the, the one thing about, and again, the really exciting thing is some of the newer therapies, you know, like CAR-T, um, when patients, after they receive CAR-T, there actually aren't on anything right now. Um, that, that is probably one of our only one and done therapies um, where we give it and then patients aren't on any therapy. But for kind of right now, for most, for most patients um, with standard induction therapy or the standard therapies we're using now, the maintenance therapy is until the time of relapse. I see. Now, the, the, one of the concerns was that she, a lady had a CAR-T treatment a year ago and still is in remission. What treatments are available after that, if any? Um, I, I can answer that. I mean, I think, um, you know, um, I would investigate clinical trials. You know, Dr. Um, Dr. Cole talked about some of the you know, newer drugs like bispecific antibodies, uh, T cell engagers, there's new targets um, and like GPRC5D, uh, you can, you know, you can retreat with BCMA therapies. I'm not, you know, we're still learning about that. So 
I, I would, I, those are the areas I've advised, you know, people to, to consider. Um, yeah, I, I, there's nothing approved though. There's no like, you know, best strategy. I think the best strategy is really a clinical trial, but there's, yeah. nothing, there's nothing like out there that we, we know, yeah, you should do this next. Like this drug is approved. There's nothing yet. Sure. Sure. And, and there's a lot of really interesting preclinical data um, and, um, and using uh, some of the molecular drugs like the MEK inhibitors um, that may be able to resensitize patients to the IMIDs um, and uh, using some of the JAK um, inhibitors, the JAK2 inhibitors and resensitizing people to, uh, to CD38 antibodies. Um, and, you know, we didn't even touch on some of the small molecule drugs um, that are in clinical trials for myeloma. Um, just like Dr. Cohen had mentioned, the new targets um, that um, CAR-T and bispecifics, um, you know, melflufan um, is, is, uh, is another drug. And so, but really clinical trials, again, is a pointy end for, uh, for patients um, after CAR-T. Excellent. Here's a question that's interesting to me. If I do BCMA treatment, e.g. clinical trials, CC93269, can I later do a CAR-T treatment? I mean, I think um, there's no, there's no like uh, reason, there's no like biologic cancer reason you couldn't. I think what we don't know yet is, you know, for example, if you wanted to do that study, and then you wanted to get like commercial CAR T, like FDA approved CAR T. Right now, it's just a Beckma. Maybe soon we'll have Siltacel. <clears throat> we don't know how insurers will will look at look at that. You know, our experience with CD19 CAR T cells is that insurers have been pretty strict with looking at, you know, for example, the approval. You know, getting getting an insurer to cover. Yes, Carta, for example, they used to look at it and if the, you know, if you had a prior CAR T, they would decline it. We would have to try to appeal that. So that's the wild card here. I don't, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use that as a reason not to do a study. Like if you can get on a study like that, I would, in my opinion, that would be the way to go because right now you can't get CAR T. Like if you said you wanted to do it today, you know, you, you, you couldn't, you would have to wait, you know, we're not, I'm not even sure that it's fair to even say six to nine months. We mm -hmm. just you know, so I, I think you, you have to go with the best option at hand, knowing that CAR-T is, is challenging right now. Craig, do you have a comment, Craig? Um, that, you know, I'll, I, uh, the good thing is that a lot of the new clinical trials um, that are, are coming out um, are allowing, you know, patients that have had prior uh, BCMA redirected agents. Um, and so they're allowing patients on trial um, that have had um, things like ben blend wrap and saying that it's okay to have prior um, uh, prior BCMA directed therapy. And I'm sure with the commercialization of the BCMA CAR T's, that future clinical trials will also um, allow that. Okay, there's going to be two questions for Mary here. Are you ready, Mary? Yeah, <laughs> okay. ready. Is it possible to release your neuropathy under acupuncture? My spouse carried yeah. myeloma. It is? Okay, great. Um, <laughs> my spouse carried myeloma on her pancreas under VRD and acupuncture a year, had acupuncture for a year, then VRD another year and Velcade maintenance over the past five years. And she stopped in 2018. Her main thing was about acupuncture. Take it away, Mary. Okay. I think acupuncture certainly helps a lot of people with a lot of symptoms that they have. It can help with chronic pain. It can help with nausea. It can help with peripheral neuropathy, certainly. So I think it's something, if you have the ability to seek it out, it's definitely worth seeking out. I'm not sure I understand the relation to the pancreas other than that the it seems like acupuncture really helped this patient along with them receiving VRD. Did I miss a portion of that? No, it, that sounds about right. I think the main thing was okay. about acupuncture. So you got it. 
And I've heard that that does work with some patients. Here's another one. Do you have recommend, any recommendations for alleviating bone and muscle pain? I take extra strength Tylenol every morning and I'm curious if there are alternatives to Tylenol. So I think for a lot of multiple myeloma patients and really as a general statement, we ask people to avoid the NSAID, so the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs such as Aleve or ibuprofen because of the risks for kidney damage. Um, those can be really helpful though for bone and muscle pain. So depending on kind of what your kidney status is, it may be okay to take a dose every once in a while. So that's something to speak to your provider about. Um, extra strength Tylenol regularly can be very helpful. And then think like functional movement. So stretching, a light yoga class, uh, continuing to use your body and move it is also very helpful for pain like that. Oh, that's good to know. Uh, let's see. Ha have there been any studies showing better outcomes from SCT based on the time of year they were done? For example, is it preferable to do it in the summer versus winter? Also in terms of recovery and complications, time of year. Does that make a difference? I'm not aware of any studies that show um, a difference. You know, we, you know, I think probably what the, the what reading between the lines, you know, I think, you know, at least what I've discussed with patients concerns are surrounding respiratory viral, viral illnesses that are more common. Supposedly, you know, we, we think of them as being more common in the winter, but the reality is, you know, before COVID there was, there was always, you know, respiratory viral season in the summer, uh, you know, and then there was respiratory viruses in the winter. And, you know, in my experience, they're an issue all year in transplant patients. Um, the most common illnesses we see, at least uh, in, in our transplant unit are, are, are rhinovirus, RSV, parainfluenza, and those are a year round problem. So I'm not sure it really makes sense to, to do that. I think if, it, if it's a timing thing with, with a caregiver or with, you know, housing, I think then, then that should really predominate, but I, I wouldn't, I would not let that sway your thinking too much, at least in my opinion. How often can CAR T be used? How many times do we know? Greg? Yeah, I don't, I don't think we, we know that. I have, I have heard of patients re receiving uh, two CAR Ts um, and, um, um, and actually in the second one, you know, a patient had a CAR T, they relapsed and then went on, I think a clinical trial. Oh, they, re they were a clinical trial CAR T and then went um, on, uh, after relapsing, um, went on uh, the commercial CAR T. Um, that wasn't my personal experience, it was someone I heard about. Um, but again, I would you know, recommend you know, those patients go, you know, go on a clinical trial if, if available. Well, this is the first question I've heard and I have not heard in 10 of these workshops. Dexamethasone and Zometa, it seems to be causing gum and teeth pain and swelling. If yes, how can it be treated now? Is that osteonecrosis of the jaw they're, they're referring to there? I don't know that that's answerable without a little bit more information. Okay. Osteonecrosis of the jaw is certainly a side effect that can occur with the bisphosphonates. Um, some people have pain when they have that, some people don't, but you're, you would notice like a sore like feature in your mouth or an exposed area of gum. Um, dexamethasone has a lot of side effects associated with it. Um, I'm not sure that gingivitis or swelling of the gums, it's not something I think we see often as a side effect of dexamethasone or Zometa, to be honest. But it's probably best to see a dentist if you're experiencing mm -hmm. any symptoms like that. Sure, sure. I think that's part of the whole circle of treatment, um, how many things you have to pay attention to as a patient. Uh, don't have teeth, you can't eat, and then you lose weight, which probably would help me a lot. But I like my teeth and I need to lose some weight nonetheless. Okay, here's one. Um, oh, it's about herbal medicine. So I, it is sad, lots of good traditional herbal medicines using human experience over 5,000 years old are disappearing. Current new medical students, it's just, I'm, I'm curious about your guys' opinion. Students does not study these old medicines. How do I lower my creatinine level under acupuncture and herbal medicines? A man's 75 years old. 
Interesting question. You know, I was kind of surprised I looked at our medical school's curriculum. Um, and in fact, I this was just um, this past week. Um, and they the 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 class before me or the 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 lecture before me was on herbal medicine, um, which I was I hadn't seen that in the previous year. Um, and so I think that, you know, that is it, because that's a prominent part of, of, of medicine um, and, and the patient experience. I think that, that it is, uh, in, at least in medical schools, I think really becoming a, a, an issue that, um, that we need to participate with our patients um, in, um, that, you know, that, um, uh, really, it's not alternative medicine, but more complementary medicine that runs alongside what what we do. Um, you know, I think that. Um, but yeah, I, I think that I just recently saw that with our medical school. Oh, that's good. I guess. Well, I have another question, and this might be a kind of a tough one. I have smoldering high risk and live in an area with no clinical trials. Should I try the two drug or move to an area with trials? It sounds like he's got a doctor. I can I can take this. Yeah, I thank think you. Um, you know, smoldering high risk is a is a controversial area. You know, we didn't talk about this uh, at length, but you know, there there has been some there have been some studies recently that have shown potential benefit for you know quote early treatment of of smoldering high risk in the highest risk patients um, with either lenalidomide or lenalidomide and dexamethasone. Um, and there are many more ongoing. Um, uh, this, is, this is a tough one, you know, um, mainly because I, I, I personally feel like we shouldn't be dogmatic about this, that, you know, every high-risk patient needs to get treated, but I think it is definitely worth a discussion. You know, I, 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 can, I can tell you many high-risk smoldering patients who did progress, and it would have been nice to to treat them early, but I also have many that have not progressed, even some on some of these studies where we're investigating early treatment. So I do have, I think it is an individualized patient level discussion. Um, I wouldn't say you should move to try it, but I think you should, you should have probably a consultation with a myeloma specialist yes. and review the options, review studies, and just have an informed decision. Um, yeah, totally. I think that um, this is, you know, I think that's become the new bulk of our second opinions um, has been in, in the discussion about smoldering myeloma. Um, I, it's, it, and I think we need a lot more research and understanding the biology of smoldering. Um, that, you know, the, what constitutes high-risk myeloma, um, you know, based on the 20 to 20 uh, criteria, more than 20% plasma cells in marrow, um, in protein of, of two, and a light chain of 20, you know, is, is a very gross estimate of, of risk. Um, there are other more dynamic estimates of, of risk, um, including how fast the M protein is going up and if patients are developing anemia. And so it, it's not as simple as, as, as going on and you know, going on a therapy and definitely getting a second opinion is super important. Okay, this is the last question I have and it's from Mary. A patient asked if they should use a, a log or a booklet and would that help your experience with the patient where they say what they're suffering through or they're doing good and things like that? I think definitely, yes, it can be very helpful. And actually the nurse leadership board is working on uh, checklists for patients to bring to their provider visit, either surrounding symptoms or potential treatment questions. But yeah, writing down what you feel and when you feel it can be very important in us understanding, you know, is this related to the timing that you take a medication? Is it related to one of the myeloma drugs? Is this related to something you're eating or some, something else you're doing? Um, I always think it's very important. Oh, that's excellent. And, and docs, does that help you a little bit when they come in with a journal or tell you what's going on? Absolutely. Uh, I think that would be a bit better interaction and a better use of time. 
Well, with all that being said and using time, everyone that's at their desktop right now watching it, clap your hands. We had a wonderful presentations today. I can't say enough for Dr. Cohen and Dr. Cole and Mary. You guys just rocked and helped out a lot of patients. We had a great turnout today. And they, to, to prove that, they, the people have stayed on longer to ask questions and so forth. So thank you. Big, thank you from my heart. I really appreciate your time. Well, thank you. Thank you for having yeah, us. Thank, thank you. It's an honor, it's an to, honor to be here. Okay, let's go into what we're doing here. We got the video replay and the slides, right? This will be up on our website shortly. I think that one thing that I found really interesting was that more and more people are going to these slides because they can break it down individually. So you don't have 187 slides. You can go to one topic and see it. Now we've had uh, eight of these this year. So there's eight different talk doctors. Or was it 16 then? It'd be 16 different doctors roughly that are talking about myeloma nowhere can you get that kind of information the imf is information centric the most important person at the imf is you the patient we work for you that's what i want to really make the difference there you need some answers you can call our info line at 800-452-2873 or if it's late at night while you're on dexamethasone you can <laughs> email them at infoline at myeloma.org. So with that being said, you know what we got to do here. Now, the other part going on to this, your feedback is incredibly important. Don't leave yet. We need you to do your feedback, which will pop up after you sign off. And that will help me understand about topics that we need to discuss, if the program went well, and things like that. But please, 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 can't tell you how much that's important to me personally, this information that you give anonymously will help how I'm doing the program and help the IMF cater and structure programs for you as a patient. None of this could be possible without the generous support from our sponsors. Generous, I will say Amgen, Bristol Myers Squibb, GSK, Janssen, Cariofarm, Oncopeptides, Takeda. Thank you for what you're all doing in the myeloma world. It's making a better it's, it's helping make better patients. Now, the last slide here. Whoa! Go to myeloma.org when you're staying up late. Be quiet. Don't do dishes on, on dexamethasone at night. It always kind of causes a little rift between families. Go get these booklets. They're online, or you can go to myeloma.org and order them. We give you hard copies. We give you uh, uh, computer copies. You can go over to videos. There's Dr. Joe McHale. There's Dr. Dury. These people know what they're talking about and they're here to take care of you, period, period. My name is Kelly Cox. I'm the director of support groups and regional community workshops. I've been doing this for many, many years and I'm always, always humbled by how many people attend these programs. Thank you from my heart. I look forward to seeing you soon in another program.